Tony Travers to Stadsleven, live talk show in Digital Magazine uh, here in Amsterdam, monthly about urban issues in cities all over the world, Amsterdam, but also cities such as London. Good evening. You are uh, uh, a professor at the London School of Economics, the head of the Greater London Group, and you have been asked by the new mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, to research the possibilities for London to become more autonomous by keeping more of its tax returns. That's right, yes. What, the, is, it, what is it that right. you're, what are you looking into actually? Well, what uh, we're looking, we, we as a commission, not just me, but a number of commissioners drawn from across the city, different interests, uh, we're looking at the way in which uh, London, which is a city of eight and three quarter million people, but within a country which actually is quite centralized, the UK and particularly England within the UK is quite a centralized country. So the issue is how far can London begin, partly at least, to detach itself, not, not, not to leave the UK or anything silly like that, but to get more autonomy so that it can more decisions within the city about itself, about tax levels, but also about the way in which services, public services are delivered, and to bring more of the control over the city's life back to politicians who are that much more accessible to people who live in the city. So the way it works now, I gather, is that uh, taxes levied by London come through London back to the central government, and London wants to keep more of those tax revenues? That's exactly right. I mean, London has some access to local taxation, though even that is uh, pretty constrained by national government. Uh, the Mayor of London has access to other revenue sources like fares from public transport, and the boroughs, another level of government in London, also have access to a property tax and to some other charges. But if you look across the board, less than 20% of London government's income comes from its own control sources, perhaps a bit more for the mayor with those fares, a slightly higher percentage. Now, if you compare that with other cities in the world, uh, many of them have far higher levels of locally generated taxation, uh, and particularly have access to a number of taxes, not just real estate taxes, but in some cases income taxes and sales taxes, which allows the city government far greater control over what it does with public money, and more importantly, allows the mayor or city council or councils to have greater, uh, to be more uh, flexible to the needs of people inside the city rather than the needs of upper levels or national government. I can imagine that um, people, people in, in London, London feel it's unfair that much of the revenue generated in London goes back to central government and then part to, uh, back to less prosperous parts of the UK, but that people in the less prosperous parts of the UK feel it's unfair that London would be keeping more of its revenues rather than helping the nation. Well, I think that that's, let's come back to, the, it's a very interesting story, and that, let's, re, let's revisit it in a second. But just for the avoidance of doubt, I think that any proposals this commission makes uh, will not propose that London is any better off on day one. If London gets control over greater taxation, there would have to be an offsetting reduction in central government grants so that on day one it's neither better nor worse off. The big difference would be that the city would set, a control, set and control the tax base and it would then have an incentive to take care of and build up that tax base. But if I just move to the wider point, which is not unique to London, I think a lot of major cities in the world end up paying more taxes than is spent on them. And that's for the sensible reason that in you know, broadly progressive tax systems, better off people, many of whom live in cities, pay higher taxes. I think the question, therefore, is not that big cities like London or for Amsterdam or New York or uh, Paris, you know, they will pay more in taxes than all of government spending there. The question is, how can they as it were, have greater control over their own resources so they can make decisions, as I said a bit earlier, more rationally, more locally? Sound, hearing about this uh, uh, drive towards more autonomy for London makes it sound to me like a variation on Brexit. Is this Lexit? London leaving Britain? I mean, I don't think London's going to leave the United Kingdom. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, it's true, London voted 60-40 to remain in the EU, whereas the rest of England 
every single region voted to leave. Scotland and Northern Ireland, like London, also voted uh, to stay in the EU. So if we accept the legitimacy of the mandate, which we do in the democracy, you know, a vote to leave is a vote to leave. But the fact that London voted strongly the other way, I think, has to be recognised as uh, a signal about the way in which London differs. Okay, it's not unique to London. Many big cities in many countries are made up of people who have different views to that of the whole of the country. That's why we have subnational or local government, and that can then reflect those differences. Cities have different views about things to rural areas. So you I don't. You're a real I'm, diplomat, Mr. Travers. Well, no, no, London's. Hey, I am. I'm being careful here. There are you know, lots of people who live in cities who come from the countryside originally. You know, and but but the point I think is that London um, is not going to leave the UK. I mean, we, we, you know, we occasionally think about city states. There are very few real city states in the world. Singapore being the best known. Hong Kong is a rather different near city state. But most cities in most countries are an integrated part of the whole country. So there's a you know, there's space between becoming a city state and having more control over the taxes that are generated locally. Over 27,000 people have now signed a petition for Lundependence, London's independence. What do you, what do you make of this? Is, this? is there any chance of this actually happening? Is this a significant movement? I don't think there's any chance of it happening. I don't think a referendum in London would actually uh, lead to a majority of people wanting to leave the United Kingdom. Uh, they might want more control over the city, and they might want more control over you know, decisions, day-to-day -day decisions about services and taxation, or, and even immigration, complicatedly. Uh, but I don't think they'd want to vote to leave the UK. I mean, you know, London trades with the UK to a very significant degree. You know, London's, you know, if you new trades, if you come to London and use the buses that the previous mayor uh, had introduced these new sort of route master, those sort of big red buses, double deckers, new ones. You'll see at the top on the on the steps at the back, there's a plate stuck onto it saying, you know, this bus was made in Ballymena, Northern Ireland. So, you know, London needs the rest of the UK to make things, and the rest of the UK needs London um, because we, you know, Londoners buy things there. So, uh, you know, London's not going to leave the UK, but it could become more separate. This uh, research that you're doing into devolution, bringing back more of London's uh, revenues uh, into its own coffers, was initiated by Sadiq Khan, who is of the Labour Party. But the whole idea of devolution actually started with Boris Johnson, who, of course, was um, um, an outspoken conservative, shall I say, when he yeah. started the London Finance Commission. Would you yeah, say really. that the issue of London's autonomy within the UK has now surpassed party boundaries? Well, certainly when Boris Johnson was mayor, as you say, a conservative mayor, he commissioned the original London Finance Commission, supported its findings, which were for modest uh, tax devolution and slightly greater control over public services. And as you rightly say, Sadiq Khan, the new Labour mayor, is, wants to go further down the same path. Now, you know, Boris Johnson is now in national government. He's a cabinet, he's the foreign, UK foreign secretary. Now, People who go from local to national government often are less enthusiastic about devolution. I'm not saying he is, but it's often the case. So I think that if you are the mayor of a big city, inevitably you say, we want more control over what we do in the city. I think it's a natural political response and actually quite good because, you know, whatever the politics of the mayor, the city itself needs to protect its own powers to be able to make decisions for its own people. So uh, I'm not surprised that, you know, first a Conservative then a Labour mayor decides to have the same kind of commissioner looking at the same issue, perhaps we need to go further now, because uh, you know, in most countries, in most cities, devolving power is a, you know, it's a process. It's not really just an event. One of the things that Sadiq Khan wants to achieve with this new uh, uh, devolution is making it possible for London, as an exception to all the rest of the UK, to bring in EU workers and also to send English uh, abroad with a, a, a kind of status aparte, as if Brexit hadn't happened. 
Well, to me, this want... is an extraordinary uh, uh, breach with the, the, the spirit of the democratic decision of Brexit, no matter how we feel about it. Well, as I say, I said earlier, um, although the UK voted uh, 51 and a half, 48 and a half to leave uh, the EU, uh, London voted 60, 40 to remain. And, you know, by the same token that a national um, plebiscite or referendum result has to be accepted in a democracy, we can equally accept that at a sub-national level, a signal in the opposite direction also can be respected, at least in part. And uh, I think what, what's happening here is that because London, like many cities, is substantially dependent on migrant workers to make its economy work, 40% of London's workforce were born outside the UK, 40%. So London does need to be able to access uh, migrant workers uh, not only from the EU, but from other parts of the world. It has in the past. In fact, more than half of these workers actually come from outside the EU. So um, I think are we that... Talking, are we talking about highly trained, talented, uh, uh, digital fintech people, or the people who uh, do the dishes in our restaurants? Both, 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 both. It's all parts of the labour market. The London labour market needs very high skilled people coming. <laughs> the EU and from other countries besides, but also it needs people who will run the basic services of the city. And the truth is that um, London will have to continue to access migration, as will the UK as a whole. But I think what Sadiq Khan and London will have to look at is how far it's possible for London to have a standalone policy, given that London has an open border, of course, with the rest of the UK. By the way, Northern Ireland will continue to have an open border with the Republic of Ireland, and that border is open. So that's, that's the even more complicated issue than London somehow going into London. So it can always be worse or more complicated? It can always be more complicated, but remember Britain has no written constitution, and politicians in the UK pride themselves in the flexibility of their responses to anything. And, uh, you know, anything can be made to happen here. I read a review of your book, uh, uh, 50 Boroughs of London, in the, uh, on the LSE site, the London School of Economics, in which it said that you described the great tradition of planning in Britain also for this sort of political issues as muddling along. But that was really a good thing because it does give great flexibility. Well, I mean, cities are inherently messy places, and I don't mean that as a pejorative way at all. I mean, the great thing, the great joy about cities is the fact that they are um, able to produce excitement, surprise, uh, they can remove borders, they can reinforce borders, but they can remove borders both between people and between areas. And I think that muddling along um, is not always a bad thing. Cities need basic services. They need proper water, they need sewers, they need basic infrastructure and trains and so on. They need security and people need the rule of law. Once you've got all of those things settled, you can tolerate, I think, a bit of mess, a bit of muddle, because out of that comes creativity, and out of the creativity come new businesses, new social enterprises, new ideas for public services, and that is a good thing. So you know, all cities are a sort of balance between just enough government, but we never want too much conformity, I think. Final question for, uh, for our interview, Mr. Travers. Uh, you're in the middle of doing your research into devolution, more autonomy for London, at least in, uh, in the fiscal respect. When will you be finished and what's going to happen with the outcome of your research? Well, as you'll be aware, the UK government has in effect recently changed. David Cameron ceased to be Prime Minister, Theresa May now is. We have a new Chancellor of the Exchequer, our Finance Minister, who's resetting the public finances this autumn. So we want to get our initial findings into the new Treasurer, the new Chancellor, the new policy-making heart of the government before those decisions are made. That's sort of mid-autumn. And then our final report, and this is being done quite fast, is going to be finished either at the very end of this year or the very beginning of next year. So we're moving fast. 
partly because in you know, modern politics, particularly in these weeks and months after Britain voted to leave the EU, everything's up in the air and you know, we need to be aware and move fast. Well, from what I've heard you say, I would dare to assume that your report will not advise the Mayor of London not to go down the road of devolution, but that you will advise him to do it, but just it's about the how, not about the weather too. It is about the how, and you're right to assume that. I mean, personally, I'm on the record uh, many times in the past as being in favor of greater devolution of power. And as I said earlier on, Britain is a strangely centralized country. You know, it was a country that pioneered um, chartered uh, municipal government in great cities, not just in London, but actually not in London so much as in cities like Birmingham and Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, Glasgow, and so on. So uh, this is Britain's gone from these great cities, each with their own government, very capable of doing their own thing, to a very much more centralized system. You know, there are lots of theories for why that has happened. Uh, most, the one that is you know, most popularly trotted out is that Britain, as Britain's empire, gradually disappeared. The government in London, in Whitehall, Westminster, looked instead of to India and Canada, to you know, parts of the UK to govern. And we discussed that on another day as to why Britain is a centralized country. But yes, I think the commission is going to be making careful recommendations. This is Britain, you know, uh, generally revolutionary things don't happen in Britain, though you know, Brexit was uh, near it, nearer to revolution within Britain than we get. Uh, revolutionary things don't happen. So we need to go with the grain of you know, gradually releasing power from national government. But in fairness, you know, it would be in national government's best interest as well if there was a bit more freedom at the London level to manage taxes and spending more efficiently and frankly, uh, to make the tax system rather more effective. We're not, British property taxes are not actually brilliantly run. And I just think that London's government or any, frankly, any city government in Britain would probably handle them rather better. I wish you all the luck in convincing the rest of the country that it is in their own interest for London to keep more of its money and help itself forward. Thank you very much, Tony Travers of the London School of Economics. Thanks.